was, you know, the, the name Iscariot was with that um, Jewish zealot group or not. But, you know, I've always liked that theory that Jew just was one of those zealots. And he, the kingdom wasn't supposed to be about forgiveness to them. It was, it was, they were going to right all the wrongs, okay. with an, you know, and God was going to do it with an iron fist. And I think one of the things that probably, if that's true about Judas, one of the things that really hit him hard was, is that how wrong he was about God and, and his, and I think it just, he couldn't accept that he was that wrong. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. He ultimately came to believe that Jesus was a righteous man, and, uh, tried to return the money, tried to undo what he had done. Right. And we can't always do that. We can try to correct. We can't undo what we've done. There's consequences. Anyway, he. So uh, then, so then uh, Alan, so then Judas didn't believe that uh, Jesus was the chosen one. At well, least earlier, yeah. we're told that um, that he did not believe. Uh, in John chapter uh, 64. There are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. And uh, mm -hmm. that's in John chapter 6. So, okay. you know, somehow he's following along you know we we like to know as as perry said it's a lot of conjecture we'd like to know was judas just in it from the beginning to kind of uh, extort some money out of this deal uh you know how did, how did he get to be part of the inner circle there uh well, he was now, chosen, i think he saw jesus as a potential person you know overthrow the roman government you know because he had Okay. His powers. He could feed thousands of people. He saw him. He had this power, and Judas thought that he's going to be the person that's going to change everything for the Jews politically. And when that didn't happen, he saw that he was a, a really just a spiritual king. That he got discouraged, and that led to his um, you know denial and everything. We're going to see that pretty soon too, right at the the kind of the culmination of. Jesus' career, they're still arguing who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom that Jesus is going to set up. So that's that's probably a good insight that Judas was in it for, uh, you know, political power and influence, if, if he could get some of that. He went to the chief priests and officers of the temple guard and discussed with them how he might betray Jesus. They were delighted and agreed to give him money, the famous 30 pieces of silver. He consented and watched for an opportunity to hand Jesus over to them when no crowd was present. We're not told a whole lot about the details of this plot, uh, how that was supposed to occur, but uh, somehow there was a, a conspiracy, and perhaps it was, uh, we'll find out that it was Judas who led them uh, at nighttime to the garden and uh, arrested Jesus when he was away from the crowds. Uh, but before that, then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. And uh, where do you want us to prepare for it? They asked. He replied, as you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters and say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room, all furnished. Make preparation there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. So we have a situation where Jesus is able to see what's going to happen. Either this was kind of arranged in advance, 
or Jesus is able to see the future, kind of like the, the colt of the, the donkey when he enters into Jerusalem. Uh, anyway, so they find a place to uh, meet with one another and partake of the Passover uh, meal. And uh, when the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. So what uh, they're, they're eating the Passover meal. What does that uh, commemorate? Exodus. The Exodus, the time when the uh, Israelites are led yeah, to, out yeah, of put, put the blood on a uh, doorpost. Okay, we we focus upon that how they were protected <coughs> by the blood of the lamb from the uh, uh, the destruction that befell the firstborn of the Egyptians. And but why why were they eating? <laughs> why? And why have this midnight meal or this this evening feast? They were they were nourishing themselves for what? For being for the Exodus, as you said, for something new. They were they were getting ready for something that was going to happen that very night. Um, he wanted wanted uh, them to slaughter the lamb so they can put the. Uh, lamb's blood on a doorpost. Okay. And then that way, um, all those that didn't would die. Right. So that was and a major. Those that did. The blood of right. the lamb was critical. But they were also right. getting ready for, as we talked about uh, in the earlier service, something new, something big. There's going to come a big change. They're going to be led out of Egypt. They were to be nourishing strengthening themselves for that big change that was going to occur that very evening. So that's, that's why they're eating not only uh, the lamb meat, but all, of, all the other uh, items that went into the Passover meal. So they're strengthening themselves for the change that is to come. And in a sense, that's what Jesus is doing in this meal. He's strengthening himself for what's going to occur to him, it's going to be a critical challenge to him physically, spiritually, emotionally, the things that he's going to have to face. And he knows what those things are. Uh, and his disciples, he's going to later tell them, you know, you need to be strong strong in a physical sense to help you be strong in a spiritual sense. So uh, that's why this is occurring. And uh, taking the cup, he said, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. So, uh, Again, a big change is, is coming, and this is uh, kind of the last of the old dispensation, if you will. He took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. And that's, that's all that Luke really has to say about this, isn't it? A very simple couple of statements uh, and uh, other gospel writers, you know, have maybe a little bit more to say, uh, something a little bit different. But Luke is just a very simple statement that uh, this meal is one that Jesus has been looking forward to because in spite of the suffering that he's going to be called upon to endure, it's a step toward ushering in the new that's coming. And, you know, 
He says, this is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. Um, what, what is the significance of that? Uh, you know, some people look upon this observance as we as Christians have of the Lord's Supper as something's abhorrent because you're partaking of someone's body and blood. And, uh, you know, not the most uh, usual or even pleasant thing to contemplate. Some people call it cannibalism, you know. Oh. Uh, Oh, it's, it's we're, we're used to that because of the traditions of the centuries. Go ahead, Dan. Thing. He's just attaching significance to the emblems. That's all he's doing. Okay. It's been misinterpreted through the centuries, and that's why you got 20 different ways to partake of communion today out there in Christendom, you know. Yeah. But that's yeah. all he's doing, attaching significance to it. So it's meaningful when we partake, you know. And so what is the significance then of the uh, the bread as the body of Christ? We partake of that, and we take in ourselves the body of Christ to nourish ourselves uh, physically. We don't nourish ourselves physically very much with the size of the uh, what we partake of, do we? <laughs> no, we've all starved. <laughs> And that uh, paper <laughs> paste bread that we have with those little cups. <laughs> anyway, um, but the significance of this is that we are nourishing ourselves in a spiritual way through this contemplation and through this uh, observance because it recalls to our mind what Jesus did. It recalls to our mind the newness of the kingdom, and we nourish ourselves because as Jesus was challenged, so we're going to be challenged. And Jesus sees that his followers at this time and continuing on needed that spiritual nourishment to, to not enter into temptation. And so uh, after the supper, he took the cup. The cup is the new covenant in my blood, covenant sealed in blood, which is poured out for you. He, here he do, doesn't say the cup is my blood. He says it's the new covenant. At least Luke uh, says it that way. And so, uh, so much has become attached to that over the centuries traditions, uh, requirements, uh, <laughs> that the simple meal that Jesus had <laughs> reclining around the table with his disciples. Maybe if we were to do it that way, uh, get around the table and not just take a pinch, but, you know, <laughs> take a handful of bread and a flagon of grape juice, if you will, or a cup of grape juice, maybe it would seem a little bit different to us, other than, you know, just uh, kind of almost looked upon as a magic potion with the tiny portions which we partake. I'm not saying that that's, that's <laughs> wrong, but perhaps we get a different uh, thing, something different out of it if we did it a different way. What, what do you think? I think if we went back to the first century and saw how they partook of communion, we'd be shocked. I, I wonder a lot, a lot different. Uh, I wonder we we see Jesus in the upper room with twelve other fellows. I wonder how they partake of it after the uh, day of Pentecost when there's three thousand members. What do they do that next Sunday? Do they all get together in the temple? Do they divide up and meet in houses? We see later, you know, the church smaller groups getting together in homes uh, to, uh, to break bread. But we don't, you know, how, how do you do that with a thousand people? <laughs> how do you do it with 5,000? Yeah, I'm uh, sure they improvised. Yeah, yeah. And it, it, it kind of um, evolved, you know, in some ways, you know. 
for what we do today. <laughs> yeah. Again, there's a, so much tradition that has become <laughs> encrusted around it. We have our own traditions. And uh, anyway, it's... it's if, the, if the early, would they even have done it? Um, would, it would it have started immediately after uh, Pentecost, where, you know, it, uh, because I think the, the disciples, Peter, John, they would have had to, okay, oh yeah, I re remember what Jesus said yeah. <laughs> uh, on, uh, at the Passover meal? You know, maybe let's think about that. Is that something that he wanted us to do every, every Sunday or, you know, every first day of the week? I, I wonder how long it took for that to become an established uh, practice yeah. in the early mm -hmm. church. Yeah, we don't know. We just know they met on the first day of the week, according to Acts. And we kind of assume that they partook of communion every week, but we don't know that. Well, that's <laughs> that's our authority, isn't it? We, it, we, it, does, it does say in Acts, too, that they, they broke bread together in their homes and Often that breaking bread together is a reference to communion or a reference to a, a feast, a meal in which communion happens. So it seems like it was pretty early. I mean, we, we, we know it was pretty that early. Bread, bread though, refer to a meal? And, like and, we have uh, a fellowship? Well, it often refers to a meal, yes, but it also can refer to a meal in which communion seems to happen. Yeah, it seems like um, they mixed the two together. That's why I'm saying it was a lot yeah. different back then. I mean, that, it, it would make sense that they would have done it. You know, you're asking, how did you, how did you do it with 3,000 people? Well, you probably didn't, but you probably did it in your home with 10, you know, or, or whatever. And, and, and somebody else did it in their home with 10. And, and you know, it, it was a more home sort of based thing. You know, and maybe you'd meet in the temple for other things. Probably but, the way we think about it. You know. So can I ask a question? Sure. So what is the picture with the disciples sitting around the table? Is that similar to what you're talking about? Well, uh, that's what they did uh, at, uh, to observe the Passover in this upper room. They didn't sit in chairs around the table. They kind of uh, laid on their side. Yeah, uh, and a, a, a circle around the table, or uh, so they reclined is the is the term. Okay, it's just and that's how they ate their meals. You know, they just kind of one handed, and uh, so this was just done in the same way as they would have a meal. Okay, so we could have this, you know, in the church basement, or we could instead of sitting in the pews rigidly, you know. Yeah. I, you know, we'd like to know, did the conversation continue on? We kind of use it as a sacred time of uh, introspection. And sometimes with a song playing in the background, some people object to that. Mm -hmm. People object to almost anything that is different from their tradition of this. Uh, is it something that you are supposed to, you know, we're supposed to examine ourselves, but maybe we're supposed to examine ourselves more uh, communally <laughs> rather than just yeah. everybody looking at himself. We've tried different things in our service, right? We look at one another, we turn toward one another from time to time. Uh, we, uh, you know, shake hands with one Alan, another. Um, different ways. Question. Included in the, um, the the meal, um, the lamb, the bread, was it also bitter herbs too? Yeah, they would have had a you know, concoction of the Passover meal along with the bread and the fruit of the vine. So what is the significance for the uh, bitter herbs? I understand the bread and well, the wine being the blood and the body. The Jesus doesn't, you know, mention that. We assume that when they make preparation, they have all of these side dishes there. But Jesus does refer specifically to them. And I mean, we could try to reenact the Passover meal, but, you know, uh, we're not really called upon to do that. Uh, hmm. We're just, uh, you know, and that's, as Dan mentioned, really the... 
main authority that we have is Acts chapter 20, verse 7. On the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. That's basically our passage for doing it on the first day of the week and uh, for breaking bread. Of course, we add the fruit of the vine uh, to that. And in Acts chapter 2, they meet from house to house, perhaps even daily at that point. Uh, so we, we have those scriptures and then kind of the example of what the early church did. Uh, well, I think that might suggest that the early church really structured their services, if you could call it that, or you know, meals or the Lord's Supper, um, a lot differently than we do. Um, you know, you look at a modern church service in just about any denomination, and it seems like the centerpiece is um, the sermon or the singing, um, and the Lord's Supper is just something that happens, uh, mm -hmm. something else that happens and something you do. Um, whereas when, you know, in Acts, when they discuss the early church coming together to break bread, that suggests that that is the focus of the entire event. And that is, um, you know, really the most important part. And of course we believe that, that, you know, the Lord's Supper is the most important thing that we do um, during worship service. But, um, you know, may, maybe uh, the way that we do it doesn't always reflect that. How could we do it different? Got, got any ideas for us? <laughs> How could we do it different? We could spend a little bit more time on it, you know, allow a little more time. I think okay. the, like the service we're doing, you know, over the internet, it's kind of short. I personally would like to see it go a little longer, you know, to so have a little more time to, to pray and, and, and examine your life. You know, we give them like 20 seconds and that's it, you know. Um, to me, I, you give it more emphasis by giving it more time, you know. And again, it, when Jesus was there, maybe that's what they did, that they, and or, we get the suggestion, yes, as this was going on, they continued in conversation. They weren't, you know, I'm listening, uh, they were listening to Jesus, but perhaps talking to uh, each other. Um, and... Uh, we read pretty quickly that they began to question among themselves which of them might be who would betray Jesus and then who's going to be the greatest. So, you know, they're talking. I don't know how that would work. You know, I, I think you're right. The, the meetings that they had were, were different, uh, kind of just informal, uh, you know, without an agenda, we have, uh, we started a years ago having a printed agenda. And in a sense, the more people you have, the more, uh, I guess, organization you have to have. The Society of Friends is specifically unorganized. You know, they just come together and whoever feels like speaking will say something. And then, you know, that's kind of the way it is. They intentionally avoid any kind of an agenda or organization for what you call it. we call a service they would call a meeting so there's different ways to approach this i guess um, we found that uh, what we do seems to be something that is encouraging but we need to be open to something that might also be more encouraging Maybe you've met with your family at a time when you couldn't meet with the body as a whole and did it a little bit different. <laughs> maybe you, you talked among yourselves or, you know, or maybe you've met in a smaller group. Uh, uh, you know, I've, I've heard of different practices in the, at colleges, at Christian colleges where kind of people are just all together and they go up and partake of the the bread and the fruit of the vine as the the spirit if you will moves them to do that and maybe you've been seeing something like that maybe you've been in a service where you come and kneel and uh, somebody hands it to you uh anyway yeah but i think we, we being students of the bible we remember that the bible says do things decently in order 
So okay. we kind of camp on that a little bit <laughs> in okay. the Church of Christ, and uh, that's how way we proceed, you know. Okay. Yeah. Right. Paul said that. Let's do everything to the church. One of the churches he wrote to, because they were they were obviously out of order, <laughs> and, and and we're not proceeding decently in some ways. So uh, he had right. to correct them, you know. Yeah, in, in Corinthians, we get the impression that <laughs> some of these people imbibed some intoxicating fruit of the vine uh, in, in connection drunk. with this. <laughs> in a service, and they're having a meal. Are they, some of the early ones ate at all, and some of the ones who came in later didn't have any. So uh, that's not the way to do it. No, we would not be comfortable with that at all. Yeah, yeah. The way. Maybe you, in your home, uh, you, you know, you could, you don't have to use those little <laughs> cups with the, uh, the, the so-called bread on the top. You could, uh, you could bake your own bread. We, we, by tradition, have unleavened bread because we know what, that that's what Jesus was using in connection with the Passover. Uh, maybe you... Use a chalice. I don't know. People do <laughs> different things. Uh, some some people uh, in years past we've uh, taken the Lord's Supper to people who have been uh, sick, and uh, you know sometimes I've done it and they said, "Well, why don't you partake of it with me?" Oh, we already did it, church. You know. Uh, is that wrong to do it twice in one day? Sometimes at the nursing home, somebody has asked, well, why don't you partake? You pass it out. Why don't you partake? Uh, we already did. We already did. We say <laughs> other people I know, you know, who have been sick and we've asked, would you like us to bring the elements of the Lord's Supper to you? They say, no, I don't want it unless I can be a part of the group. I don't feel that I, I want to partake of that. So people have different views on that. Mm. Uh, that it, you know, they, they feel that it really has to be a group activity. So I, I, you know, as I say, there's so many traditions and thoughts that have become encrusted over the centuries. But I, as Joshua pointed out, we ought to be open to ways which would make it more meaningful. Uh, maybe we have a sermon in between. I don't know <laughs> how to do that. But anyway, people are, uh, <clears throat> you know, if we allow dances, allow more time, that's hard, you know, because if we spend a lot of time, a lot of us get carried away into thinking of, you know, what are we going to do that afternoon or what else is going on? Uh, it's hard to maintain the concentration. And it was hard for Jesus' disciples, right? Because they were right there. They began to question, uh, you know, Jesus said, somebody's going to betray me. And they began, who's it going to do? Who's going to do that? Interesting that they didn't appreciate what was going on. Also, a dispute arose them among them as to which of them was considered to be greatest. I wonder what Jesus' reaction is. Surely he sighed when he heard that here. It's kind of a of such a meaningful thing for him. And he detects that at the other end of the table, they're debating who's going to be the prime minister in the new kingdom, who's going to be a secretary of war, and so on. And he has to bring them back to re his uh, reality. The kings of the Gentiles lorded over them, and those who exercised authority over them called themselves benefactors, lords. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. You are those who have stood by me in my trials, and I confer on you a kingdom just as my father conferred one on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, 
there's the eating and drinking again, and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, kind of a, so what's Jesus' answer? Who's going to be the greatest? You're all sharing in the kingdom. You're all, you're all sharing in this, in, in what's coming and, and you all have a, a, a part of it. And, and there's no need for playing the power games that the, the world around you plays. You, you have, you all have been given this, this great place in, in, in the kingdom that's coming and, and you can sit at my table and, 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 you know, you get to lead the 12 tribes. I mean, it's just, it's just a, um, just a, a, a beautiful picture that, that they're all a part of this thing and there's no need for the, the gamesmanship that they're playing. Yeah. Yeah. And it's by serving others that you win honor yeah. in the kingdom of God and that you, um, that you earn this, this high place, this leadership role. So Jesus would probably say, you're asking the wrong question. The question should be, how can we be servants? And then God will take care of you, and you will sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. How's that going to happen? <laughs> Some people interpret this, well, they're, they're going to judge the 12 tribes by means of their teaching. In other words, their teaching will, uh, you know, some people will obey and some people won't, and some there'll be a differentiation there uh, between those who obey their teachings and those who reject it. So that in that way, they'll judge between those who accept Jesus and those who don't. Uh, but we'd like to know more about that, wouldn't we? Uh, <clears throat> We're told uh, in Corinthians that we'll all uh, judge, right? Uh, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Do you not know that we will judge angels? That's quite a thing. How much more the things of this life? What are we going to be doing? That just we talked about that. That in the kingdom, uh, you know, we think about well, we'd be sitting around praying. There, there'd be something going on. We'd like to know more about that. The saints will judge the world. These uh... anyway. Uh, here, and we'll just we'll close with this next and we'll go into that thank you for your thoughts on the lord's supper and uh, if you have more we can certainly talk more about it here but jesus in talking about this simon simon satan has asked to sift you as wheat but i have prayed for you simon that your faith may not fail and when you have turned back strengthen your brothers. Uh, but he replied, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. But Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. So again, Jesus is concerned about what? Spiritual warfare in the life of Simon and in the life of his other disciples. I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. Uh, how often do we pray for ourselves that our faith will not fail? How often do we pray for others that their faith will not fail and that they'll prevail in the spiritual battles that they face? We pray for those who are battling sickness and that's that's great but how often do we pray for those and that's just about everyone who are battling satan that's pretty important too isn't it i would say the answer is not enough <laughs> yeah that's right not enough not enough 
Satan's always on the prowl out there. That's right. Well, down. We don't always know. Uh, we're, we're not as good as Jesus at telling when someone is being tempted. Yeah. And often people aren't honest about when they're that's, being tempted right. and what they're struggling with. So that, that makes it difficult as well. Yeah. How often do we say, hey, uh, brother or sister, I'm, I'm tempted. You know, we, that's, we don't want to admit that because that, you know, might lessen us in their opinion because we think it's a sign of weakness to be tempted. But we're all tempted. Well, we'll take it up there. Thank you for your thoughts and wisdom. Uh, do we have a song? I, I look forward to these songs on Sunday. Okay. Subscribe, my heart is made to deep me for birth and song. As the burdens press and the cares distress, the wind blows weary and long. Oh, yes, he cares, I know he cares, his heart is sought with my being. When the days are weary, the long nights weary, I know my Savior cares. Does Jesus care? when we on this service we only see one person talk at a time on the zoom at 9 30 on the service yes so when we talk you only see one person at a time not like on the wednesday one right <laughs> yeah, 30 is a one-way service yeah <laughs> okay that's what i my question Thank you all. I appreciate y'all. Okay. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. We'll be participating. Bye. Bye. Take care. Have a good week. Happy New Year, everyone. Happy New Year to you, too. Okay. Kisses. Okay.